Welcome, everybody. My name is Paul King. If you haven't met me, I've met most of you, but uh, not, not everyone, perhaps. So um, I'm uh, one of the key contributors on the, the, the Groovy team, and I've done a lot of work in um, the functional space as well here and there over the years. So this will talk about uh, functional Groovy. Um, OCI, they uh, pay me money to work on Groovy, so they're a, a good company. Um, they've got a stand out there and lots of uh, toys, so be, be uh, sure to go and um, visit them and uh, sign up to win some prizes, including a uh, signed copy of Groovy in Action, which has got some stuff on functional programming inside it, so there you go. Um, so what is functional programming? It's uh, in its simplest, the simplest definition is it's just a programming paradigm that emphasizes functions. Okay? So we'll elaborate later what emphasizes might mean. There's several aspects to that that are important, but at this point, it's just uh, as long as we can do um, functions, then we're, we're good to go. So is Groovy a good language for doing functions? Uh, yes, it is. Groovy has had closures since version 1, and closures support uh, first-class functionality. So we can create pure functions. We can create... Um, closures can interact with their environment and uh, be impure. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. We'll discuss that as a topic. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of uh, capabilities that we can use out of um, you know, Java-inspired Java capabilities, some of them in JDK 8, that we can leverage as well. Um, there's Lambda expressions, method references, streams, those sorts of things. We can uh, leverage all of that if we're, if we're trying to adopt a functional style in, in Groovy. And even if we uh, don't want to use all the latest streams and whatever else, you, you can get a, a, a little way just static methods and utility classes. If you've used those 10 years ago, you were doing functional programming back 10 years ago. Um, they're, they're just a method that returns a value based solely on its inputs would be a pure function that you could go and create in JDK 1. So um, there you go. But Groovy doesn't enforce functional programming. So if you really want to go and train yourself up to be a functional programming uh, guru, maybe uh, Groovy is not the best language for you. Groovy will let you be imperative. It'll let you be functional. It'll let you, um, it's, it tries to be a little bit paradigm ag agnostic. So whatever style you'd like to do, Groovy will, will, will support you. If you want to go use a logic programming a library, by all means, go ahead and do that. So if you want something that's going to be a little bit stricter, you, you've got uh, Haskell, or you can go um, uh, Frege on the JVM is a, is, a, is a nice option that you can go and um, uh, make use of that'll require you to be a bit more functional than what Groovy will require for you. So when you're using Groovy, it's often a matter of style, a matter of following certain conventions, avoiding certain things that would be uh, bad practices. And we'll, we'll have a look at some of those that um, I think are important things to, kn to know about, even if you... Um, don't necessarily want to go and turn your whole code base into something that's uh, super functional. Being aware of where you're crossing the boundaries of things that are, are um, good functional style and bad functional style will actually help you to write better uh, OO libraries, better um, procedural libraries anyway. So it's just some, some things to uh, have a look at. All right, so closures were the things that, that gave us uh, functions. So there's a closure, and uh, it's... Here we're just adding, we're passing in some parameter num and we're adding it to itself and returning the, res the result. So that's a pure function. The output of that function is solely determined by the input parameters. So that, and we can just call it as if it was like, like, like a method call, you, it, the, the same sort of syntax that you'd expect. Lots of options. You can have, uh, uh, I, I could have not supplied the parameter there for num, I could, and I, I could use it, which is the, the default parameter, I could uh, have types, not have types, I can have default values for num, I could have int num equals uh, three, and then if I don't supply num, three will be uh, supplied and so on. So lots of options there, I'm sure you've uh, seen a lot of that stuff. If you've already got a bunch of methods and you want to turn them into uh, more closure-like functional style things, uh, method closures are, is a good option. You can uh, use the the dot ampersand operator to do that converts a method into a closure, or if you're on uh, Groovy 3, you can use the, the double colon, similar to what uh, Java would let you do for method references. And all the things that you'd expect, there's forward and backward composition, so if you've got some of these closures, you can combine them. 
Um, if you've got some and you want to fill in ahead of time some of the parameters, you can use partial application with the, the curry function. There's R curry, N curry, and other things as well. So you've got a lot of uh, capabilities there. And um, full first class uh, citizens uh, when you're using closures. So you can pass them around as parameters, put, put closures in data collections, and so on. Right, so here's back to our first uh, closure that I showed you, and I told you that was a, a pure function. So that, um, even that we could debate over over beers and because it um, in fact has a um, like a, it's got knows about this, knows about delegate, and other, um, a few other little bits of information that a pure function maybe you shouldn't even know about. But um, in most common usage uh, patterns, you can totally treat this as, as a pure function. Now this one down the bottom, it's, there's a I've got a class definition, I've got an at log annotation on the front, so I'll get an automatic uh, log uh, implementation supplied in my uh, class here. And I've got a closure definition in the middle of the class. So that's just a, that's just a, uh, a field of the class. Check answer is the name of my field. And I've got a closure definition inside there. Is that a pure function? No, it's not, because... The output, is gonna, which is this uh, guess uh, equals an the answer, is using this the answer thing. Now, where did that come from? Uh, it's not, that's not one of the parameters that get passed into to, to this, uh, this closure. In fact, it's just a constant in the class. So um, what closures do is let you uh, reach out into the environment in which the closure is defined. The log variable is actually a, another... Uh, field inside this class that the at log annotation gave me. So again, I'm reaching outside this closure and looking at stuff. Now, is that evil? Is that because I, that's not a pure function? But is it evil? No, it's probably quite le legitimate usage of uh, closures capabilities. Those things, in fact, both co the logs are uh, a constant that's not going to change. The answer is a constant that's not going to change. I am not really going to have any problems with that sort of thing. There are other cases if you reach out. In, in this particular example, we'll come back to this example. Um, this particular example, I'm, I'm just going to add one to, uh, to the parameter that gets passed in, but I'm also going to increment some other variable outside the scope of my closure. That could that's, that's a side effect that could potentially be much more difficult to reason about. And so if you're doing things like that, then we need to uh, think a bit more about what, what uh, is going on, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk about that topic. So that's kind of just a um, We've got this mechanism, closures. We have to apply a bit of style to do it well. And um, that gets, that's gets that been in place in Groove for a long period of time. And right throughout the code base, th those things permeate. And uh, there's actually a lot of good, good functional practices that have been um, uh, put in place in all the Groovy libraries uh, using closures in, in good ways. So that's, that's the good news. Um, but what, how do you go about using uh, closures and, and um, using sort of good style? Well, often it's, it is just a matter of style. So let, let's just have a look at a little problem here. Now the details of this problem aren't too important, so if you don't read every character on the slide, don't, don't worry too much. But I'm going to check if a number's prime, and I'm going to check if it's a palindrome. So everyone knows what a palindrome is? Same forward and reverse, yep. Prime, it, there happens to be a very efficient way to test for, for primality based on factorial. So I've got a quite efficient factorial, um, well, reasonably efficient that can fit on one slide version of factorial using compiled static. And that's going to be good enough for us. Don't, the details aren't, aren't important. And what I'm going to do is look at the numbers between 100 and 200, and I want to find all the ones that are prime, all the ones that are palindromes, and all the ones that are both. Okay? So we'll start out and we'll think imperatively, because that's, you know, I've been using Java since ver uh, before version 1, and uh, imperative and OO and things were in my mindset, so I'm going to start off solving this imperatively. And so I can have a bit of a for loop, and I can run through all my numbers, and then I can check if they're prime, and if they are, I'll add them to some list. And I'll check if they're a palindrome, if it is, I'll add it to a list, and so on. And if it's both, add it to another list. And so that's all well and good. And then I might, again, I've got my... So I'm telling the, I'm, it's a very imperative style, I'm telling the computer what to do. Start with an integer of zero and then increment along and do things. So I'm being, being sort of uh, very bossy to the uh, compiler, telling it exactly what it needs to do, and, and I'm in control. The nice thing about being in control is I can say, ah, 
I've got my efficiency hat on here and I think calling, even though I said I've got a pretty efficient factorial method there, I think calling is prime might actually take a little bit of time. So what I'm going to do is actually store away the result of uh, is prime and is palindrome. And now I can um, just test that Boolean. Oh, wow, I've got some efficiency savings and the imp using imperative allowed me to do that. So this functional stuff, don't ever look at that because you lose control of being able to do things imperatively like this. So this is, this is good code. So let's, let's um, continue on and see how the story unfolds. So the ne next step is, OK, well, let's look at how we could do a functional thing. You know, maybe, maybe this functional thing has got some uh, merit to it. So let's have a look at what it might look like. And in fact, Groovy's got all the libraries to solve this problem. You just call find all, pass in is prime, and you get your answer back. And then I can call find all with is palindrome. I've got my answer for that. And so this is much more declarative code. The chance of, you know, the previous code, did I get uh, an off by one error in my loop? Did I, should it have been less than instead of less than and equals in one of my tests? Um, much less likely to screw this up. Find all, passing in, telling it what to do, and, and there's my answer. Unfortunately, it looks like if, if, when I'm doing my both, I'm calling back into his, his palindrome and his prime again. So unfortunately, if, you, if you're going to go functional, you're going to lose the ability to uh, be efficient. Is that really, really the case? Uh, well, no, because I can uh, just twist things that are a little bit round in my mind and come up with other ways to, to uh, get an efficient solution. So I can, I can just go get the sets of things and then find the intersection of the sets. So I can actually, even, even when I'm adopting something that's very declarative and very functional, you can actually be in full control. And in fact, I can even, if I ever need to, not, and I'm, I'm, I'd suggest that in this case it's a bad thing because I'm making my code a bit more obscure, but even if I'm adopting a, few, a purely functional style, there are ways to dive down a layer below and you know, get a functional solution uh, where I'm, again, in control of what's happening. So here we're using inject and we're got full control over how things are happening and I can put my efficiency uh, thing in place there as well. So the good news is we, c we can go and um, adopt functional style and still have reasonable control over efficiency and we'll, we'll end up with usually a lot more declarative code and we can just introduce that as we get more familiar with uh, some of these concepts. Right, so that's, I said at the start, it's uh, emphasizing functional uh, and emphasizing functions. What, do I, what, what are some of the other things that, if I'm trying to emphasize, what should I be looking at and what should I be doing? Um, th there's several bits to it. One bit's this declarative style issue, but I, I can actually do declarative style with imperative code. If I'm writing little testing DSLs or I'm using a logic programming engine, I'm using very, very declarative style and I'm not doing functional. So declarative is one aspect, um, but it's not the only thing. Controlling side effects, that's a huge aspect. So for me, someone w would often say, uh, if, if you're a, f oh, well, a, a functional programming fanatic would say, ban side effects. Now, well, that's ac absolutely not what we want to do because the side effects are the things that do everything that's interesting in our program. So we can have a pro if, if we have a program with no side effects, it can never print something out at the end and tell you what the result was. So that's a side effect. So we want side effects, but the sin is it's not, uh, sin's not having uh, side effects, it's not knowing which parts of your code are impacted by these side effects. So that's the thing that we want to make more visible. And that's where languages like Frege have got some extra features that, uh, and, and Haskell, of course, have got extra features that make it super obvious. Haskell will, and, and Frege adopt some of this, um, make, force you to sort of uh, have to, jump through hoops to, to get these side effects in place. So we're not going to push you down that road, but in fact, you can actually uh, go down as far down that road using Groovy as you want, and, um, but you've got, to sort of be, you've got to do it yourself more than the compiler is going to uh, assist you. Well, we, we'll t we can talk about that more later. The other thing is managing mutability. So again, a... a, a, a um, someone who's a, an advocate of functional style would say, immutable data structures everywhere. Now, I'm not going to suggest that's what you need to do, but what I'm going to suggest is, uh, if you are going to have mutable data structures, you should be very aware of where you're using those mutable data structures and uh, the impacts of using them throughout your code base. 
And we'll have a look at some, some options you've got for that as well. Right, so this is that sli same graph in, in words. I'll let you go and read the, sl the slide deck and all the, co the code examples of this are on GitHub and Speaker Deck respectively, so you can go and uh, read all this uh, a bit later on. We've got like, a few examples I'm going to whiz through. So I'm just going to emphasize this bit on uh, pure functions again. So are these both pure functions? Well, I've kind of already revealed to you uh, in the earlier slides. And, uh, and hopefully the naming of these methods, um, I didn't try to trick you with the naming. So in fact, the, uh, the first one is in fact a, a, a pure function, the second one's not, it's got a side effect. And what that means is, when I'm, um, in, in the first uh, bit of code, of, I'm defining x to be some value 4, and later down in the code I'm asserting that the value is still 4. And if I've used pure functions everywhere, I can do that as many times as I like. Okay? In the, once, if I use the side effect, call increment with side effect a couple of times, x is now 6. So something that the casual observer might uh, not expect to happen has now happened. And that's, um, that's the, the, the several things in play here. But the, the, the key thing, and we'll talk about referential integrity, which is something that's going to uh, be a a way to emphasize what's happening here in more detail. But the um, first thing you should notice is there's a, uh, a lot more obscurity in the intention of what this code is supposed to do if I start using side effects. So that's, that's the first uh, the problem with this. So in general, you, sh you, yes, by all means, have pure functions everywhere. Avoid functions like this that are going to uh, cause trouble. Now, there are places we saw on that earlier slide that yes, if you're going to call a constant, calling a log or whatever, by all means, there's, there's uh, th things that, that you can do there. Um, so th there's places where it um, can, can be uh, used. So I'm not saying impure is evil, it's just more difficult to reason about. Okay. So if I've got a pure function, I can reason about what that function does just by looking at its inputs and the output. That's it. If I don't have an impure function, I've got this big purple box that I have to reason about. I've got instant state, static and global state. Uh, I can have instant state. Um, I can be modifying instant state, modifying global state, mo uh, mutating my parameters. I could be throwing exceptions. There's, there's much more that I have to reason about to understand my code. Yep. Um, now, if we go back to that log, the log and uh, constant example, I do have to reason about everything inside the purple there, but the reasoning can be done very efficiently. Yes, I've got a couple of constants. I can tick the box um, using impure functions, but everything is OK. Um, you, you should be doing that exercise. Yep. And if, if you can't do that efficiently, you're probably doing something that you shouldn't be doing. So. Uh, Avoid this sort of stuff, is what I'm saying. Use with caution when needed. Right, so it's, it's kind of, a, there's a thing called referential transparency, which it uh, overlaps with that concept, but it's, uh, there's a particular aspect of this that I'm trying to stress, and, and um, if you get in, dive into the functional world, um, a lot of the, um, the things that they try to do are, are, are based around this concept. So let's, let's just quickly explore this concept. Um, and we, so we saw this already with that impure function. I had an x, and then it, it got modified. But I've, I've got the same sort of thing here. I've got y is assigned or constant. I've got x is y plus 1. A bit further down in the code, I've got z equals y plus 1. Now, to the, again, to the casual observer, I might expect to be able to uh, assert that x and z are the same value. And it's the exact same thing we saw before with the, the impure thing. Here I've got a thing called do something. It's not even giving me a hint that it might be doing, uh, doing something that um, is uh, semi-bad. But uh, let's have a think about what things might happen inside do something. I can't, so do something has a parameter, which is going to get passed in. We're going to be passing in y. Um, but it's actually going to be a, a local reference to that parameter. So I can go and set it equals 99, and that just sets the, it doesn't change y. But it, so I'm, I'm doing a impure thing, mutating stuff, but it's going to be okay because it's in only going to affect inside the scope of my closure in this particular case. 
Yep, or I can do IT++. So there's certain things I can do, but other things, again, because a closure can reach out into its environment when needed, here I'm reaching out into my environment and I'm modifying Y. Right? And this is the same as that uh, incrementing the X example we saw before. So obviously in this case here, because I've gone and reached out into my environment, modified Y, these two expressions, X and, X and Z, even though they're the same expression, they're going to have different values, obviously, because Y's changed underneath the covers. And it's not, not obvious from the code here that that sort of thing should be happening. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, laboring the point, but it, it might not always be obvious that something could be uh, going wrong. So here I'm, I'm not, it was, it was fairly obvious up here because I'm going Y equals 99, so I'm doing an assignment to something outside. And so if, I'm, if I go read this closure, it's going, wow, uh, that's crazy, what's going on here? And I'll, as a programmer, probably know, oh, something fishy is going on, I better sort of sniff into this and look at what's going on. Other times it'll be a bit more subtle. So here I'm passing in a list and we're calling clear on the list, which it's, we're mutating the parameter that's going in there. And again, if I'm if, if, um, trying to look at the size of the list before and after, I might expect they're the same, and obviously they're not going to be the same because I've gone and mutated things. So um, what's the moral of the story here? Um, because do something may or may not be pure, I, I, I can't really tell whether these uh, expressions that we're looking at should be the same. If I could tell that it was pure, then... Referential transparency is uh, in play, and there's a whole lot of things that open up to me. And in fact, I can open them up to the compiler. And if we had uh, a way to annotate your closures with, you know, I am pure, which is what Frege does, um, if you're, you know, calling into a Java library, or whatever, you can tell it whether or not you're doing pure stuff. We could actually make the uh, Groovy compiler look at things like this and do some of the optimizations that are possible. So what's possible? You can have automatic memoiza uh, memoization. So I'm going to I'll talk about that uh, later on. You can automatic caching of any method call. And the compiler could just do that for you automatically. You could do automatic concurrency. You could get more reuse through a whole bunch of uh, functional abstractions, monads, monoids, and a bunch of other stuff that I probably won't get time to talk about today. But there's plenty of things that we could do. Um, so there's a whole lot of, if only we had this capability, we could do a whole lot more. And, and that's one of the things that would be, uh, it's going to be nice to um, have a think about future versions of Groovy, whether we can head more down this path. And there, there is some place, there is some s scope to do some stuff without um, totally violating things. Um, but you might, you might sort of think, well, is there, do I really need all that sort of stuff? But it, it, it's actually very powerful. What a, what a functional programming compiler would do is it would look at code like this, and it would see that you're calling uh, Pythagorean method passing in two parameters A and B and then it would d detect that A and B are actually constants and then it would go and look at the uh, the pure function p p uh, Pythagorean and its outputs only in terms of its inputs and then if I've got a function that's got constants and its outputs are only in terms of inputs I can actually calculate that at compile time the compiler will just do the calculation and it'll say oh yep I've uh, already done that for you and I've I'll, I'll, I'll go and change your bytecode, and this is what I'll put into your bytecode. And so this whole concept of reference tra uh, transparency, it's not just an academic functional programming argument. It's a very, very powerful mechanism. If we had this, we could do some, some nice optimizations in, in our bytecode. And there's ways that we can do it to a certain degree, even in Groovy, and, and um, go forward with this sort of stuff. Be a little bit wary. Let's have another look at the whole concept of referential transparency, there's, there's some subtleties that may not be obvious when you're looking at this uh, first off. What I'm going to do now is look at a different problem. I'm going to, I've got a, a, a data structure of numbers, so six numbers up there. They're actually, it's actually a stack. And what I'm going to do is pull them off two at a time, and I'm going to just calculate the exponent, one to the power of the other. And... Uh, this is, I'm not doing anything fancy here. Um, I've got, the, the second last line is the uh, obvious way to do it, just based to the exponent. I've, again, I've put my optimization, my, my, perhaps my premature optimization hat on, and I've actually said, well, I actually know that if uh, the exponent is ever uh, zero, the answer is always going to be one. So I'm going to try to be super efficient here and do a little shortcut there as well. And actually, that works fine for this example as we've got. But there's actually a hidden, subtle uh, 
aspect of programming in Java or Groovy that um, we're relying on for this program to work? Does anyone have an inkling of what it might be? No, there's... What's order do the parameters of POW get calculated in? Does anyone know the rules for Java? It's the same for Groovy. <laughs> same for Kotlin. Left to right, okay? It's not magical. So I go s.pop, pull something off the stack, and that becomes the first parameter into POW, and I go s.pop, that's the second parameter into POW. If I pull them off in the reverse order, everything would get screwed up because instead of 2 to the power of 3, I'm going to have 3 to the power of 2. Okay? So this works perfectly fine, but it's relying on that subtlety. And that subtlety wouldn't exist in a pure functional language. It doesn't matter what order you put those in if you've got referential in integrity. So um, what I didn't, I didn't belabor the point back here, but with referential integrity, every variable can re be replaced by its value and vice versa at any time. Yep. So here it doesn't matter what order and what things um, uh, are done if you've got if this was referentially transparent it's actually not um, it wouldn't matter what order those things happened in I'm going to show you a, 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 something a bit later on okay so that's all well and good and that all works but what we're going to do now is we've heard that laziness is a good functional thing so we're going to introduce laziness into this example and instead of just calling s dot pop I'm going to I've got a little closure lazy pop and I'm going to pass that in, and now inside my power method, instead of base to the exponent, I'm going to have call base to get the value to the exponent. So does that works? Yes, that all works fine. Okay, well, let's, um, I've got my efficiency hat on again. I want to optimize this. Of, uh, let's put the optimization in. Is this going to work? Boom, boom. What happens is, because I've done my optimization, I'm not going to call both base and exponent anymore. I'm just going to return one. So I'm not pulling the things off the stack that I was expecting to be pulled off here. Right? So on the left-hand side, I've, got, I've pulled off exponent, and I've compared it to zero. But if it does happen to be zero, I'm never going to call base and pull off the other parameter. And worse, if it's not, I'm actually going to pull off exponent a second time. So I'm actually going to start pulling off the parameters for the next one as well. So I've really screwed myself up here. If I actually put the numbers in in exactly the right place, I might get a 1, then a 3, then a 1, then a 3, and have an even number, and I might fluke it, but I'll have the wrong answers. But uh, in most scenarios, I'm going to screw up here. Okay, so what should I do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm, that exponent thing, because I pulled it off, and then I'm going to pull it off again, Let's just uh, remember that first. And again, I've, I've still screwed up because I'm still not calling the base version in the, in the uh, optimization case. So I really need to go and pull them both off, and then, then we're fine. Now, you might think, oh, Paul, you're a, you're a lousy programmer. There's no way I would uh, ever do that. But I can show you this example again and just put optional there, or just put future there, and you've got this exact same scenario with a slight twist. And you probably will go and use those things, and it's easy to screw those up. Um, you, have to be a, you have to do a tiny bit more than what I've done to screw them up, but it's, it's not hard for me to show you an example where those screw up. So you really should not, in fact, not adopt the approach that I showed you at, on any of those slides for this particular problem. You should actually try to do it with referential transparency. So in fact, we should leave stack as, as immutable. Don't go and start pulling stuff off stacks. I mean, if Griffin, only if, if, if Griffin had only done that, we wouldn't have had a, a, a bug to fix so yesterday. But, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do here is leave the stack alone and just have some indices that walk through the thing and pull off the things that I need from the right position. And that's referentially transparent because I can pull that off in any order. I can start from the one end and go to the, to, to, uh, I, can, I can go from left to right or right to left as long as I keep the indexes the same, same way. I can do this in parallel. I can, um, I can cache things. I can, 
I've gone and um, I've got partial application happening here so I can make things uh, more efficient and do all sorts of things. So this is the way you really should solve a problem like this. And it doesn't matter now that my last line has got calling exponent or base once or twice or zero times. It's all going to work fine. Does that make sense? Um, so Groovy doesn't have a compiler that can do detecting of uh, referential transparency. So we all screwed. What do we do? We can go and Groovy lets us uh, give the compiler a little bit of uh, uh, a nudge, a hint, uh, basically a, a way we can uh, do those exact same things ourselves. So we're going to have um, various mechanisms, and we'll look at a few of those. So the first one is memoirs. So this is the automatic caching. So if, if I know that uh, I've got a function whose outputs are, in fact, always uh, determined by its inputs, I can just go and auto-cache it. And I can do that for closures and methods in Groovy. This is an example of doing it uh, uh, with uh, closures here. So I've got an upper closure that's going to just uh, finding the uppercase equivalent of a letter. So I've, got, I've basically got a 18 uh, letters there. And I'm forced to actually the time. I didn't update this slide. The, it used to wait a second. Now it's waiting half a second. But anyway, um, it, if it was waiting a second, it would take 18 seconds to run. If I turn memoirs on, in fact, I've got uh, seven different characters out of the 18 characters that are there. So in fact, it would only take seven seconds instead of 18 seconds. So I'd get the uh, optimization happening. And you've got the ability to do uh, memoirs at least, memoirs at most, memoirs between, if you want to have hard and soft references to things, so you can have a sort of a cache that expands and, and shrinks if you're running out of memory. Um, so, so you can do this sort of stuff yourself, and it's not too hard, and um, that's, a, that's an appropriate thing to do. Again, it should be done on pure functions. Do you think um, math.random, coin.toss, dice.throw are good candidates to try your memoirs on? Not unless you want a random number that's uh, not very random. So, if you're going to, if you if you're running, uh, if you're trying to uh, win it two up, then uh, maybe it's a good thing to do. But otherwise, I'd uh, avoid it for those sorts of things. They're not pure functions. Methods as well. We've got uh, at memoized um, annotation. You can put on a, a method, and you'll get the same thing uh, coded into your uh, code. It's a little cartoon here. You probably can't uh, see what's happening in the back. They're discussing the kind of bugs we're going to have in 100 or 200 years' time. And they're thinking that we're going to have these corrupt strands of DNA, uh, or because of desynchronized quantum calculators, that's going to be the errors. Clear the cache. Clear the bloody cache. It's still going to be a problem with our memoization things in the future. Immutability. So that's the other thing that you should um, consider doing. I'm just going to um, give you a subtle uh, variation on what most people will tell you. Most people will say everything, you know, all this mutable data structures in the in the JVM, it's all garbage. Don't ever use it. I'm not going to suggest that. I'm going to suggest be a little bit smart and use it when it makes sense, and don't use it when it doesn't make sense. And I'm going to give you some options. Um, there's a little bit more style here. You, you can actually even in individual lines of code you can s stop mutating things very, very easily just by adapting your s style a little bit. Now, I'm not going to go into it here, but basically in the first example, I'm mutating stuff as I go. In the second example, there's no mutation at all happening. And it's just by using some slightly different uh, method calls, doing things in a slightly different way, and a whole lot of smells that were in the first one um, go away. There's some things here that pr to prefer the mute, uh, immutable uh, ways to do these things. And Groovy provides you with uh, lots of options there, so you can do things. And I'm, I'm going to I'm going to skip this as well. I'm going to talk about immutable collections and things uh, coming up very shortly. So I'm going to skip this. It's just telling you how you could go and use a few of the libraries that are around. Um, if you're creating your own classes, you can go read Effective Java and remember the, all the 18 rules for for writing your own um, immutable classes, or you can just use the immutable annotation in, in Groovy. So you should be doing that. Over and above that, you should be looking at uh, persistent data structures. And what, what do I mean by that? Am I talking about databases? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, there's a thing called persistent data structures, which, which um, is all about data structures that are persistent in memory, typically. 
and um, they don't get mutated. And we'll talk about wh how this all works. So let's look on the, on the left-hand side here. And sorry, the, um, the it's a little bit faint in terms of the colors that are coming up on that screen, but hopefully you can see it. If I've got a mutable data structure and I've got uh, two characters in, in a string, sort of, sort of uh, I've got a data structure representing a string, and I want to add a third character, I just, I've probably got an array list storing all my characters. I just slot another one in and I muta mutate the sucker. And there's certain algorithms where that's still the most appropriate thing to do. But going back to impure and uh, reference and transparency and so on, you might uh, work out how to containerize that to be all inside one class or in a very limited scope where you're doing that mut mutating. Sometimes it is appropriate, though, in the certain algorithms where it's the uh, only efficient way to, to um, mutate certain data structures. Another option is to, once you've got a data structure, you never mutate it. And if you do need to uh, modify things, you create a new data structure with the mods in place. Okay? So if I've got a CA data structure, I basically throw that away and I create another one with CAT. When I say throw away, what I really mean is anybody who still wants to look at the old value, they'll just keep pointing to the old one. And I've got, now got a new one. Anyone who wants to see the new one will now need to look at the new thing. And the theory is no one sees it in between when I did those changes. I've still got a bit of a synchronization problem if I need uh, to pass around to people the fact that something's changed and you should be now be looking over here. Um, so my problem's changed, it's not gone away. So the, um, yeah, th that's, this is another option. The third option is persistent data structures. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, a few things to look at there. Um, what's all that about? What it means is we're creating data structures that never change. And we do it in a different way. To, so the problem with this uh, second approach here is you end up with a lot of dupe, dupe, duplication happening. So yes, I've only got two characters in the first one, and then I've got another object with three characters in the second one. I've duped the first and second characters. Doesn't look too bad, but if I've got big data structures and large numbers of these things, I'm starting to get lots and lots of duplication happening. And for certain algorithms, that's fine. That's, that might be the most efficient way and the appropriate way to do things. But uh, what persistent data structures say is, well, we'll actually have a way that lets you not have the duplication. So we're going to let you have a C and an A, and we'll let you add the T. And people who are still looking at the C and A, that's all, they'll still see that. And people who need to see the CAT, they'll, they'll, that's what they'll see. But I'll share the data structures between the two views of my big tree. Yep. And so here's an example where I've got pets. I've got three pets. I'm going to go and buy a goldfish. So I've, uh, now I've got a new pets. And my, my, golf, my, my fish is the uh, last one I've added to this uh, collection. Anybody who's interested in my new pets will now see all four. Anyone who's uh, looking at the old one will just see three. They won't know any different. And uh, life is good. Uh, what happens if I now want to um, remove the uh, horse? It's going to be a little bit of work. And in fact, at this point, there'll be some copying of data structures and shuffling stuff around. And um, again, everything that's there will persist. Anybody who's looking at the three list, they'll still see the three list. Anyone looking at the four list, they'll still see the four list. Anyone who now wants to see my version without the horse, they'll now get pointing, pointed to the, uh, the purple one down the bottom. And I have had to do some work here to, to copy some of the data structure around. So I do have some dupe now. But I've got the minimum dupe possible that lets every, you know, all the different people that might be viewing my data structure see all the things that they, they should be seeing. Yep. So that's how percentage st structures work. And the good news is there's very smart people looking at building libraries that, that uh, perform certain operations with these kind of data structures very, very efficiently. So there's a whole bunch of different um, red, black trees, finger trees, a whole, whole bunch of things that you can go use that give you highly optimized uh, ways to, to uh, manipulate your data structures, even in scenarios like what, we're sh what I'm showing here. And the same thing happens with uh, trees. You go and make a mod on a tree, and, and again, there's a, a, it shifts the tree around, and you need to go and uh, do things. There's, there's uh, ways to make certain kinds of operations on these trees that are very, very efficient. You can go look at a bunch of libraries, uh, VAVR, P-Collections, Bagheera, there's a bunch of them. Functional Java and Functional, Functional Groovy have got uh, these in place as well. So um, look into your trees, but uh, 
remember we might be changing the requirements underneath the covers as, as you're trying to pick which tree that you're going to uh, be uh, looking at. Um, streams is another topic um, that uh, allows you to, and, and lazy evaluation is, a, is another, another topic we can look at. I'm not going to spend uh, very long on this. In fact, I'm going to skim right over this section. Um, streams is another important thing you want to do if you're doing functional programming. There's a lot of uh, examples already available that show you how to go and use streams from Java 8, and you can use all of that in Groovy. Um, you're probably already doing lazy evaluation, even if you're in Java version 1. Well, actually, Java 1 didn't have short circuiting. But anyway, that's another story. So if you've got a if statement with a double ampersand short circuit in it, you're, you've done lazy evaluation programming. You may not have realized it, but, but the right-hand side's not going to get evaluated if the left-hand side um, is uh, already false. So that's, that's um, short circuiting. That is a form of lazy evaluation. If you're using G strings, you may or may not have lazy evaluation in play. If you're using XML Slurper, you've got lazy evaluation in play. If you're using the uh, Groovy SQL capabilities with data set, lazy evaluation already in play. If you're using singleton with the lazy flag, if you're using the at lazy annotation, um, or some of these other libraries, totally lazy, uh, Jeepers with uh, totally lazy, the Groovy Stream library that was there before Java 8 stuff came out. Monodialogo is another sort of uh, old library that supported this sort of stuff. Functional Groovy, all of these things have ways to do uh, lazy evaluation and streaming type operations. So you can go and um, have a look at those. Two more topics. One's recursion. So this is all about Rather than, you know, again, it's trying to move away from imperative. Rather than do this, then do this, then do this. Recursion's all about, I can't solve the big problem, but I know how to split into two smaller problems, and so on and so forth. So I don't, don't know how to solve factorial n, but I can solve, I know it's n times factorial n minus 1, and hopefully factorial n minus 1 is a simpler problem, and we'll apply that recursively and get our answer. Just a little trick, if you're going to uh, try to use some of these things in Groovy. Does this code work? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, what Groovy will complain about is I'm trying to define factorial and as a closure, and in its, in its, its definition, I'm referencing factorial. So Groovy will complain about that. We could make the compiler smarter and do sort of forward referencing for this, but um, we don't. There's a couple of little tricks you can do. If you just declare your factorial variable first, you can now happily use it. Um, <coughs> In, in that form, or you can use a little trick by using the call method as well. So there's some tricks you can do, um, and that'll let you write uh, recursive functions in Groovy. They will be subject to uh, Stack Overflow. You can twist the algorithm around, and it's still subject to Stack Overflow, but it's now in a form that's um, known as uh, uh, tail recursive. If you go and uh, put it into that form and then add the uh, dot trampoline mechanism, then you can actually have a version that will basically implement that uh, the recursive function that you did iteratively. It, it does that under the covers, and there's a version, there's mutual recursion versions, and there's versions for uh, methods as well. So there's some things to, to go and uh, look at. So yes, Groovy uh, can do recursion. You might have to do a bit of work, where, which you might not have had to do in a, a purely functional language. Why do you like functional programming so much? Well, recursion is its own reward. There we go. OK, last topic. So there's, there's actually two examples in the slide deck. I'm just going to uh, look at uh, one of these. So, so this one's. Uh, on monoids, one is on monads. I'm just going to cover the first of those. You can go look up the slides if you want to want a, a little bit more detail. We're going to try to solve a problem. This is um, uh, Guy Steele did this problem at, at Strange Loop uh, eight years ago now, and this is this is Fortress. So this was uh, a, a research language that was potentially going to replace uh, Java as the uh, the language to use because it did concurrency really well and did functional stuff and whatever, but it never really got the funding and traction to, uh, 
to go forward, and people didn't know how to type that uh, wacky character into the keyboards very well, so um, you had to use LaTeX codes and things, but anyway. anyway. So um, let's have a look at uh, solving this problem. So the problem is I've got a big chunk of text, and I'm trying to count the number of words in the text. I've got heaps of cores available to me. Um, how can we solve it? Well, I can solve it iteratively. I can just walk along and just whenever, whenever I find a space, yep, that's a new word, and, oh, and off I go. But if I'm trying to uh, split it up, so, so that's my iterative version. If I'm trying to split it up, how do I know where to start my counting? Because I'll get into some middle, of, middle segment, one, one of these things here, and I don't really know whether L-I-A-N is the start of a new word, or is it trailing off an old word, or what's going on here? So at first glance, you might think, this is not a problem that's amenable to a concurrent solution. And um, then you can go scratch your head a little bit more and say, ah, I've got a, a little idea. Um, I'm going to try to do it concurrently. And in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count all the stuff in the middle. So when, once I see a space, I know that's a word boundary. And uh, the last space I see, I know that's the end of a word boundary. I'll count all those words. And then I'll just remember, oh, I've got a bit of stuff to fix up at the front, and a bit of stuff to fix up at the end. Yep. And if, if I adopt that approach, um, what I can do is solve two big chunks, and then I can get the answer for what would happen when those chunks get joined back together by adding in all the, the count that I got from the left-hand side, adding in all the count from the right-hand side, and then having a look at the two end bits and saying, right, I've got to fix this up. I've got to have another operation that tells me how to uh, tidy up one, a left-hand end and a right-hand end when they're conjoined. And um, in fact, that we can do that. This is um, a little example that does that. And um, we can now solve the problem concurrently. And what it, this is an, uh, something that you should uh, consider when you're wanting to do things concurrently, and in fact, that's one of the things that functional programming was going to, it was going to give us automatic concurrency in, of certain problems. But what we can do here is, if you've got a problem that doesn't seem like it can be uh, concurrent, you twist the problem around very, very slightly, and you can make it one. And you might think, you know, gosh, I don't have the brain power to sort of come up with solutions like that all the time. Um, in fact, we actually just followed a, um, we, uh, a very set of, uh, simple set of rules. We actually had a, um, it's what's called a monoid. And we, we just needed associativity and the left and right identity elements. Right, so the left and right identity is basically to cater for, you know, what do I whack on the, see the, uh, the shaded boxes with the dotted lines around them. And if, I've, if I'm at the end, I need to have an identity operator to handle that scenario. And then I um, need associativity so that I can do this one, then this one, or this one, then this one, and then I can join them, join them up at, uh, later. And the, the actual join, conjoin operator that we uh, developed in our little solution uh, does that for us automatically. So you can go and take your problems, put them into this form, and then you can get concurrent solutions. So there's version, there's little on the slides, I won't go through them all, there's versions here that do solve this with concurrent hash maps, with, um, what have we got here? Uh, there's, there's data flow examples, there's uh, fork join examples, there's actor examples, and all of them solve that automatically once we've, we uh, rephrase the problem into, into uh, that particular style. And I've uh, run out of time to show you the Monad one. You can go look at the uh, slide deck for that, but the important thing is, uh, the most important Monad to know about is the Monad Lisa. So, uh, Go and have a look at that if you're ever in, the, in Paris. OK, so the, there is um, some more, uh, another example here that's uh, worth going and having a look at. Go and have a look at that if you want. And uh, some useful references. There's a whole bunch of libraries that help you do functional programming. And as I said before, there's some really interesting areas in the functional space that we hope to uh, be able to incorporate in future versions of Groovy, or at least have libraries that can be easily used with Groovy that in incorporate some of these ideas. Okay, uh, thanks very much.